Hi everyone, I'm Mexi and I am a settler. I am a settler on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, the Wendat peoples, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, and a diverse array of different First Nations, including Inuit and Métis. I want to emphasize that there are countless incredible, courageous, kick-ass Indigenous activists, youth, academics, elders, etc., who are already talking about this and doing a really, really great job. So I'm going to link a number of resources in the description box below that you can check out. And I'm also going to link a number of Indigenous media sources and people that you should be following on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, etc. I wasn't sure whether to make a video on this um, as a settler and knowing that so many other people had been doing such a great job, but um, people have been asking me to weigh in and I was in inspired by a video put out by one of the Unisotan matriarchs, Frida. And, you know, sadly, sometimes people need to hear it from someone who's benefiting from the oppression as opposed to oppressed peoples themselves. So I'm really hoping to reach fellow settlers here and to talk about what this whole land back movement means for so-called Canada and why we should actually be really excited and really enthused by it. If this video is not demonetized, which most of my videos are demonetized instantly because I don't tend to talk about monetizable subjects, but if it is not demonetized somehow, then I will donate all of the ad money that I got from this to the Unistoten camp and the Wet'suwet'en and the Tayendinega Mohawk legal funds, etc. So if you don't know what's been going on in so-called Canada, Indigenous peoples and their allies have been shutting her down. The RCMP, which is the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, recently engaged in an illegal militarized invasion of sovereign Wet'suwet'en territory in BC, arresting peaceful land and water protectors, protecting their unceded territory against the coastal gas link pipeline. The Wet'suwet'en proposed an alternate route, but CGL refused because it would go too close to urban areas, aka white areas. So the Canadian state and their militarized police decided to just force it through the sovereign indigenous territory without the consent of the title holders. By the way, the RCMP felt it was an appropriate time to invade when the Unistoten matriarchs were holding a ceremony to honor all of the murdered and missing indigenous women across Canada. In solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en, indigenous activists and their allies have been hashtag shutting down Canada, engaging in peaceful rail blockades, taking to the streets, calling representatives, etc. Indigenous youth have been occupying legislature offices, particularly in BC, and there's been a massive showing of support. Of course, there's also been some pretty virulent and racist pushback as well, but I think that overall it's been a pretty great opportunity to educate the broader settler public about colonial law, about band chief and council versus indigenous governance, about the treaties and what they mean and what our treaty responsibilities are, etc. So although I'm repulsed and heartbroken by the level of colonial violence that's been escalating so far. I'm also very, very hopeful that this is a movement that has a great amount of solidarity all across Canada, and this is a movement that can help to shift the discourse in so-called Canada and to make us think really deeply, not just about pipelines and not just about keeping it in the ground because we only have 10 years to turn around climate change, etc., but also more broadly about how tenable the settler colonial project is, how tenable the capitalist project is, and, and that's really exciting. So I'm going to start with the law because there seems to be a lot of confusion around this and a lot of pro-pipeline people or just pro-police, pro-white supremacist states, anti-indigenous people are really, really concerned with the law, laying down the law. And they will say that land defenders on their own sovereign territory are breaking the law. Protesters are breaking the law. And we must enforce the law. We must respect the rule of law. Because of course the law has never been unjust. So let's talk about colonial law. Even though indigenous nations were sovereign nations who each had their own complex systems of governance and law prior to European brutality, when the colonizers arrived, they just declared that their law was the real law, which we uphold today, even though we legally recognize that, yes, these are sovereign nations, 
with their own laws and governance systems and that they have been since quote unquote time immemorial, somehow that doesn't call into question the validity of our own law shrug but okay and a lot of people think that they were just able to declare their law as the real law because they had the bigger guns and might makes right right that's what we're always teaching the kids in the schoolyard if you want something from someone and they say no just just hurt them until they relent the bullies make the rules but actually, this fascinating book, 1491, which was recommended to me by Green from the Indigenous Anarchist Federation, shout out, this book demonstrates that when it comes to combat, actually indigenous nations and colonizers were pretty well matched, but what the colonizers did have were just a lot of germs. They were real germy. So this idea of colonial law being valid because of might makes right mentality is pretty sketchy considering we do acknowledge that these are sovereign nations and they always have been sovereign nations with their own legal systems. It would be like today a group of Canadians just heading over to Spain or Japan or any other sovereign nation with their own governance systems and laws bringing a bunch of germs and a bunch of guns and just killing a bunch of people saying, well, we're here now, looks like we're the majority. So our law is the law of the land. Your laws mean nothing. We will not respect your laws, but if you break our laws, we will kill you. Oh, and by the way, we're gonna set up our entire legal system to disenfranchise you and keep you in poverty. I always quite like the house metaphor that imagine you have a beautiful home and you welcome strangers who were lost. Then without even saying thank you, they quickly take possession of the house, impose their laws on you and lock you in the basement. There are a number of amazing versions of this that take this metaphor even further, but I mean, hey, yeah, where's the lie? So, all right, that's pretty flimsy reasoning. But even if you're somebody who thinks, oh, come on, colonialism, that happened way in the past, right? That's ancient history. Just get over it and move on. Well, Put a put in that because we're going to come back to the ways in which colonialism is, is not something that just happened in the past. It's an ongoing structure of dispossession that is very much relevant today, but also foundational to our law and to our rights to even be here on this land are the treaties that we have made with indigenous peoples. And a lot of people misunderstand the treaties. They were sharing treaties sharing treaties, and we all are treaty people, meaning we all have treaty rights and responsibilities. A lot of people think that the treaties are only about giving rights to indigenous people, but that's not true. And the treaties weren't, you know, okay, here's the deal. You allow us to colonize and invade and develop your territory, and in return, we'll give you these small parcels of land on reserves that are insufficient for you to practice your traditional livelihoods on, but hey, we'll give you the, the right to hunt and fish if you want. So there, that's the deal. That's the deal, sign here. No, they were sharing treaties and we actually agreed to share the land, to respect the land and care for it and uphold the sanctity of the land such that indigenous nations could continue to practice their traditional livelihoods freely in accordance with natural law and have self-determination and self-sufficiency. Having the right to hunt and fish in your traditional territory territory means nothing if that territory is destroyed. If it's been poisoned by mercury like in Grassy Narrows or like so many other places that have been poisoned by development or just paved over by settlers. And the deal was if we honor and uphold these treaties, then what we get in return is the right to be here. I want to read this passage by Wayne Ducheneau for you because I think it is beautifully written. When you look at the treaty rights that Native nations maintain, they are minuscule compared to the treaty rights gained by non-Indigenous peoples. A lot of people don't know treaty history or choose to ignore it. So when Indigenous people try to exercise treaty rights, say to hunt, fish, and gather on off-reservation lands, they get strong pushback from some non-Indigenous people who see Indians as somehow getting special treatment. Put another way, some people erroneously view treaty rights as a gift from the government to Indigenous nations. They are not. They represent an agreement negotiated between two sovereign nations with rights and obligations applying to both sides. When non-Indigenous people want to rip up a treaty and, say, end special fishing rights, they are effectively tearing up their land deed. 
This is why the Crown and Canadian federal law has a duty to consult with Indigenous peoples on any project that could threaten their treaty or Aboriginal rights, is what they call them. Because it's recognized that for any of those rights to have any meaning, there needs to be protection of the land. Now, they're very, very good at getting around this duty to consult and just forcing through things anyway and carrying out these complete sham consultations. That's actually a lot of the, not, I don't do work on the sham consultations, I do work exposing the sham consultations. And in a lot of cases, many indigenous nations have been so harmed by colonialist projects, capitalist projects, destroying their territories, uh, giving them no access to their territories and, and few economic opportunities, that often they end up saying yes to dirty projects, even if it's not ideal, because what do? But if we've completely broken these treaties, then do we actually have any right to legislate anything in this territory or claim any of this land as ours? We're the ones who agreed to this. Most of the time, we're the ones who wrote these treaties, and a lot of times we force different nations to go into different agreements under duress. I remember reading an amazing book by Chief John Snow called These Mountains Are Our Sacred Places, where he, he goes into this. He's from the Stony Nakoda Nation and goes into all of these agreements that were signed under duress and where basically they were just lied to or tricked into things. But even with all of that trickery, we still made these agreements and then we broke them. And we want to say what's legal here? And beyond that, there are unceded territories where there are no treaties, like Wet'suwet'en traditional territory. Some background info is that Section 35 of our Constitution affirms that the existing ancestral or treaty rights of Indigenous peoples are confirmed and recognized. And in 1997, a Supreme Court decision, which I won't try to pronounce, recognized the ancestral rights of Indigenous peoples over their territories, as well as their traditional leadership. This means that unceded territories are under indigenous jurisdiction. And since then, there have been a number of decisions in the Supreme Court that have affirmed different nations having title, rights and title over their territories. So the Indigenous Environmental Network writes, we as Wet'suwet'en have never ceded our sovereign title and rights over the 22,000 square kilometers of our land, waters and resources within our Yunta. Our Wet'suwet'en law and feast governance systems remain intact and continue to govern our people and our lands. We recognize the authority of these systems. The Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs are the title holders and maintain the authority and jurisdiction to make decisions on unceded lands. And people are confused, or they, maybe they were confused and it's maybe being cleared up now because band chief and council is in support of the project, but the hereditary chiefs are not. But band chief and council does not have jurisdiction outside of the reserve. Band chief and council is actually a colonial system imposed by the colonial state. So as I mentioned, indigenous nations had various complex systems of governance before colonization, but in order to become legible to the colonial state, they had to adopt these hierarchical, bureaucratic kind of governance systems, which goes completely against you know, many of their ways of governing themselves. And in fact, many, many nations actually were matriarchies or were matrilineal prior to this imposition, but the colonial state, being completely patriarchal, decided that the only people that could hold office were men. So it was very harmful, it really disrupted gender relations and just disrupted indigenous ways of governing things, um, which in the Wet'suwet'en case revolves around the hereditary chiefs. So in unceded territory, we don't have any treaties, so we don't actually have any right to claim that land. That land is in fact not Canada. It is a sovereign nation within Canada where our jurisdiction, our laws do not apply. The RCMP has no jurisdiction there. That area is under indigenous jurisdiction. And so they certainly don't have jurisdiction to impose an injunction for a private company because that's what this is all about, imposing an injunction to further the profits of a private company. And the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline didn't even have environmental assessment approval. Their environmental assessment was just rejected. So I don't even know why we're still even talking about this, but the RCMP was willing to invade sovereign Wet'suwet'en territory on behalf of a private company that didn't even have approval under Canadian law. How ridiculous is that? 
So the legality of all of this is highly suspect. And recently, the OPP, the Ontario Police, moved in on the Tyendinaga Mohawks on their unceded territory and started arresting people there, where they also have no jurisdiction. They were camped out beside the railroad tracks in their sovereign territory, peacefully protesting, and yet the police moved in to arrest them on foreign land. So if you have the means to donate, please do. I will put links in the description box below. You can donate to their legal funds, everyone who is on the front lines of these fights. But, you know, although this is absolutely horrifying that this is happening, and I say that not because I'm surprised that it's happening, but because the whole colonial state and all of its violence is horrifying. But, you know, despite how horrible this is, I think that a lot of people are starting to question the legitimacy of the colonial state, the legitimacy of colonial law more broadly, and what right we have to force people to accept this brutality against their will. Like I said, this wouldn't go through a white area, and it didn't. And I mean, imagine this happening. Imagine this trying to go through some affluent area in Ontario, right? It just, it would not happen. And beyond colonial law, it violates international law, it violates the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or UNRIP, which Canada has signed on to, and which BC recently voted to uphold. Under UNRIP, you need free, prior, and informed consent from Indigenous people, from the title holders, if you want to do anything in their territory. And people keep saying, you know, consent doesn't mean a veto, consent doesn't mean a veto, but that's actually kind of exactly what it means, <laughs> isn't it? That's, ex that's exactly what it means. I actually really love what Seriously Wrong tweeted about this, that if I ask you if I can cut your hair and you say no, and I cut it off anyway, did I, did I get your consent? If I'm forcing a pipeline that's likely to poison your water and threaten your very livelihoods through your backyard and you say no, and I get militarized police to force it through anyway, did I get your free prior and informed consent? So as we can see, colonialism is not something that just happened in the past, like this event that we can just move forward from. This is very much ongoing today. We are continuing to alienate First Nations and Indigenous peoples from their land bases in the name of capitalist gain. And this is very much forceful, and this is very much militarized. Plus, we continue to not uphold the treaties. We continue to break the very foundation of our rights to be in this territory. This is an ongoing process. So I argue that unsettling Canada is important, regardless of whether it would have a positive effect on the environment, just because the settler project is untenable and unjust and, and brutal. So it's, it's wrong, it's the right thing to do to unsettle Canada. But upholding the treaties and decolonizing the land will very likely have a tremendous positive impact on the environment at such a crucial time in this climate crisis. Indigenous people are 5%, less than 5% of the population, but they manage and they protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. On Turtle Island, many of their constitutions revolve around respecting natural law, living in reciprocity with our environment, and preserving and upholding the land and the waters for seven generations into the future. They have been and continue to be on the front lines of the fight to protect our land and water from capitalist greed and destruction. We owe such a debt of gratitude. I mean, like we owe way more than that. We owe reparations, we owe sincere reconciliation and decolonization, but we also owe a sincere debt of gratitude to them for being on the front lines of this fight for the future, for all of us. And we don't need to be scared as settlers of what it means to decolonize the land, of what it means to learn to uphold the treaties, of what it means to learn to live in the nations that we inhabit to learn to live in reciprocity with the land and water, to learn to respect one another and respect the land and protect it for seven generations into the future. This is not scary stuff. This is exciting and exhilarating stuff. This is partly why I love the book Braiding Sweetgrass so much and I always recommend it because it's just, it's so beautiful to think about the possibilities. This is really fertile ground that we're on right now. 
amazingly fertile ground. So what an opportunity we have right now. What an opportunity to learn and to grow and to, to heal ourselves and to heal our relationships with one another and with the land. What's scary is the opposite. What's scary is licking the boots of the RCMP and this increasingly militarized police state that is apparently very ready to go out there and violate people's human rights in order to protect the profits of industry. Industry that's destroying the planet. What's scary is sitting idly by and watching this happen to us in slow motion, watching species increasingly go extinct, oceans rising and turning into acid and dead zones and the air becoming toxic. What's scary is deluding ourselves with this fantasy that a growth-based, profit-driven, exploitative capitalist system is ever going to be remotely sustainable, remotely compatible with a sustainable future or with a future that's based in social justice. I mean, we are all exploited by this system just as much as the land is, really. I mean, our corporate overloads, they don't care about us. They don't care about us at all. They want to extract our labor from us. They want to extract wealth from us. They want to take whatever they can from us and from the land to make themselves rich. They want to pay off politicians to weaken regulations for them and to cut social spending and to funnel money up the hierarchy, up into a concentrated fewer and fewer people's hands. That's what this is all about. We're staring down a pretty horrific dystopia if we just allow the status quo to continue and we allow the police to do their bidding for them, to force us to comply. That is what's scary. That is what's dystopian. That is horrifying to me. So personally, I am very enthused by the land back movement. I am very enthused by the idea of decolonizing. I am 100% here for it. That is exciting as hell. That actually represents possibility, possibility to move beyond this shit that we're in and this, this future that we're all, we're all watching. We're all watching it come towards us in slow motion and we're not doing anything. And frankly, I think if this movement can call into question the colonial project, then we're also calling into question the capitalist project as well. And that is exciting as hell. So this is not over. I know that the hereditary chiefs have met with government agencies and they've come to an agreement, but that agreement was only around their rights and title. It wasn't about the coastal gas link pipeline specifically. And as well, the rest of the nation has to sign off on the agreement for it to be valid. But to my mind, this movement is about so much more than just this one pipeline. And I think that's why it's in a really, really exciting time. And I think that we should all be embracing this and, you know, learning from this and taking this as an opportunity to really, really critically look at our own settler colonial project, our own complicity in it and what we can do together in solidarity to move forward. So again, please support this movement. I will put links below and please follow all of the respective media and news sources and things like that so that you can get this stuff directly from Indigenous peoples themselves who are on the front lines. And thanks, I will see you in another video. Special thanks to Tristan for editing this video. As always, thank you to everyone who supports the continuation of these videos. Please consider supporting if you enjoy my content. It helps me to continue. Check out my podcast at veganvanguardpodcast.com. Find me on Facebook and Twitter. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and I will see you in another video.